Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with legendary soprano saxophonist and composer Jane Ira Bloom. We caught up with her on January 15, 2021 to talk about a new virtual project full of magic that she did with longtime collaborator and bassist Mark Helios. And the project is called Some Kind of Tomorrow. They are bandmates that have been around each other for a while, but they were separated by space and time and found a way to play in real time with one another. They are both master improvisers and composers and the results are impressive. Jane is originally from Boston and she has had a great jazz ride that's led her to Yale, New York City and around the globe. She talks about that and so much more. Enjoy. Jane, thank you for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz. I appreciate it. Oh, I'm a ple- pleasure to be here. So let's talk about this duo combo with Mark. You've been bandmates for a long time. We are obviously in a very extreme situation here on planet Earth in 2021 with a lot of things going on. You create this during a very raw, stark time on our planet, which I think would be very rife, a very Bob Dylan moment for the planet. Talk to me a little bit about this project. Well, you you nailed it, Joe. I mean, um, we really just had to play. <laughs> we had to uh-huh. figure out how to do it. We had to figure out how to do it. We had to figure out how to do it over the Internet. Um, and, you know, we're enterprising you know, people, and uh, Mark has great skills um, in terms of recording and helped me and, and uh, helped himself. We decided to just try to connect and to record ourselves best as we could individually. Uh, as, as You know, we can talk about it later, but we, we wound up taking the files of each of us and lining them up correctly because we were just listening to each other on Zoom and playing with each other on Zoom. <laughs> Isn't that an amazing thing about the adaptability of the jazz community? And I think about creative people during this time of the pandemic. I think that it's really pushing people to new skill levels and creativity heights. Um, Do you see that as a part of this process where you guys came together for something magical that you would have never thought would have happened prior to 2020? Absolutely. You know, like we were, we, not only that, but we were picking it out of the air. You know, you have to remember we didn't we didn't plan any compositions or anything. We just decided to improvise together, based on you know what we heard and a, a deep need, as as you said, to to play with one another. And it was so profound. You know, even after that, I remember the first session when Mark and I played. We were both almost like giddy. It was so great to play with each other. Uh, yeah. It was almost euphoric how we felt uh, when we were playing. And then we got, you know, a little smarter about h- how to record a little better and uh, bring bring the sound uh, to, to a better place. You know, and I think that's kind of something I've thought about with, with interviewing a lot of musicians and seeing how this year has unfolded. This pandemic and everything that's going on has a monopoly on us, and I'd hate to see this time getting wasted. And not only is it not getting wasted with material that you're putting out, that you're capturing moments that would have never been able to have been captured in any other way before. I mean, so did this add to the magic of it to be in this position where you couldn't be together and just with what's going on in the world right now, did that add to the flavor of your jazz mix? Of course it did. Not that I ever would have anticipated it or wanted it, but hey, it's what we were given. And, you know, it, just like you said, you know, music always finds a way. and <laughs> Musicians always improvisers always seem to find a way and so that's that's what this is about really what you know in this longing of live music in this period do you have any moments that you think about that you remember from from the live environment that keep you fueled and keep you going until you get back to that point well sure and and even when i get the spark uh, just the spark of hearing uh, uh, the other or another sound that well, you know, it's like a muscle. Uh, it's, you you don't lose it, <laughs> yeah. and and uh, it it uh, is very very familiar. I mean, sure, I would love to play with a full rhythm section. A little, little difficult to orchestrate uh, with a drum set, you know, <laughs> given uh, the circumstances. But it, it's it's coming. It's coming. What do you hope we all realize when we get back? You know. I don't like to use the word normal. I don't know that we, I think when this began, there was a notion that it was going to be a big blip on the radar, but that we would get back to it. But I think all of these things that we're doing, whether it's social distancing or operating in different ways, have become a part of our lives that's interwoven. And when we do find a break and we do have a vaccine and we do have newer hopeful things going on in this country and we do get back to live venues, what do you hope the musician on the stage and the audience member realizes about this time away from live jazz? 
Well, just just what you would think, you know. It makes sure makes you appreciate it when when you don't when you've been taking it for granted and then suddenly it's taken away. It sure magnifies uh, the intensity of how important it is of the physical uh, location, nearness of uh, your musical collaborators, and and how that affects how you play and what you play. I think we'll just have a newfound kind of uh, reverence for it, to be honest. So what do you see the, I, I, I like to call it the revival when we return, what do you see the revival being like, you know, uh, approximately how this is going to kind of unfold? Do you have any kind of visions of how this will happen? You know, I wish I, I could anticipate, I could not I could never anticipate what's going on now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, if it's anything like how uh, the history of, of improvised music has gone, it's in its very nature to evolve, and if it's doing its thing, if it's doing what it should be doing, I, I shouldn't be able to anticipate it. In other words, it's, it's in its nature to, you know, to be new and to surprise me. So if I'm surprised, then that, that, that means the music is, is doing its job. What do you like the best about being a musician? What, what motivates you the most about waking up each day and playing music? Well, you know, we're an interesting group, musicians, and particularly improvisers. You know, as you mentioned, you know, unlike other people, we are kind of used to a, a somewhat solitary bits of time. You know, when you think about the amounts of time that musicians spend in practice rooms alone <laughs> and composers alone inside your own thoughts and stuff. So it's not that we're not used to that world. You know, you find when you have the opportunity uh, to play, to 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 think and to play. Let, let me ask you this. What was the first live jazz show you saw that really made you think, man, this is what I would love to do with my life? That's a great question. If, if I could remember it. I, you know, I have an early member, or early memory, really early memory, of seeing a saxophone on a stage and there was like lighting, you know, like blue, red, purple lighting. <laughs> and I'll never forget how how that saxophone looked under the light. <laughs> that's yeah. a very early, that's a really early, not even how it sounded, but how it looked. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. That, that's, wonderful. That's, that's a powerful early memory. I, I'm not even quite sure where it's from. I wish yeah. I could remember uh, that what might have been some early performances that were very meaningful to me. Uh, certainly a lot came to my ears through, you know, vinyl, through LPs and stuff. But the first live performance, I, I think somewhere back there in uh, Boston, I can, uh, I can remember going to the Jazz Workshop or Paul's Mall, and I think I might recall seeing Sonny Rollins, and I think I might recall seeing uh, Mingus. Those, those were some early, early gigs, and I was, yeah. I was still in high school. Those were pretty, pretty important. You know, you're a mentor to players that are around you, and you've been around some heavy people in your life. What have you learned from the legends of luminaries that have in turn made you the mentor and teacher that you are with younger players? Well, you know, especially being around some of the, you know, the musicians who are part of that, that primary generation of uh, people who, who invented the thing that we call jazz. And the thing about being around them that I think I've learned is why they play. <laughs> Not what they play, but why they play. And I find when I'm with young students, transmitting some of that information about wh what the feelings are about, about why you make music, is really important connective information. Let me ask you this. If you have a dream tonight and you run into your younger self, the, the self that's getting ready to go out into the world and become a musician, and you could give your younger self right now advice based on what you've learned over all these years, what would be the one piece of advice you would give your younger self? Wow, that's a great question. I never had that one. <laughs> well, it's going to take time. <laughs> take it easy. Yeah. It's going to take time. It's going to take time. <laughs> I don't think I, I even had any sense of how long it was going to take. And uh, the other piece of advice, you, know, you, you ever had one of those uh, experiences that you um, regret for the rest of your life? You should have done something differently? I can remember being asked by Laura Nero to go on the road with her. And at the time, I was very busy in other aspects of my music, and I didn't take her up on it. And damn it, I should have. Yeah. <laughs> I really should have. She, she was one of my heroes uh, when I was growing up, uh, musical heroes. And uh, I, sh I wish I had taken that gig. I think I was uh, stupid. It's no, no, there was nobody around to tell me, <laughs> tell me yeah. how stupid a decision that was. But I've regretted yeah. it for the rest of my life. <laughs> wow. 
You know, I love the quote. I love the saying that you just said, it's not what you play, but why you play. And my, my question to you now is, everyone has a perception of who you are, your family, your friends, and your large fan base. You're the one living your life. Who do you think you are? Wow. That's heavy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, that's, a, that's, that's a tough one. Who do I think I I think I'm surprising myself. I, I, I sometimes thought of myself with a certain rigidity. Uh, you know, certain people like, like their uh, routines and, and pr- you know, practice schedules and all that stuff. And if anything, in the last year, I've been finding out uh, how much more adaptable I am than I thought of myself. <laughs> Why? Because I had to. I just didn't have a choice, you know. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save an easy one for the very last question. And I want to know, what do you want those that download the recording some kind of tomorrow to get from this? What do you hope they feel and get from this very magical work that you've done? You know, you you never tell a listener what you want from them, but I I certainly hope that they find something that speaks to them uh, in a, in a quiet way in this music. It's, it's intimate music. It's a duet of just uh, a saxophone and a bass, but with all the, attention and detail that we could possibly get um, to trying to communicate the warmth and resonance of our sound, whether it's the warmth and the wood of the bass um, or the the round uh, sound of the, uh, you know, the the brass sound coming from a soprano saxophone. We really were trying to communicate something with the sound. I hope, I hope that that uh, is something that's, that's uh, enjoyable for people. We, We did our best. Absolutely. Jane, thank you for taking a minute out to Neon Jazz today. Good luck with this recording and the return to the proverbial live stage. Oh, thanks, Joe. It's, it's great to talk to you. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview. We give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Boston, New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Jane for being a beacon in the world of jazz. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com and for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.